Hi everybody, welcome to the Parallel Systems Broadcast. I'm your host Mike and tonight I've got quite an episode for you. We're going to be reviewing, or should I say looking at, a book that was recently released called The Great Taking. And this is really the counterpart to The Great Reset as you're going to find out tonight. Now, this book is probably one of the most disturbing books I've read in years, many, many years. In fact, it could be the most disturbing book that I've read in my entire life. I've read some pretty disturbing books, but this one's up there. It's certainly up there. And that's because of the implications of this book. If you understand this book, then you understand that something absolutely catastrophic has been set up, almost like a controlled demolition. Now, I know on this channel we talk a lot about the controlled demolition of the financial system. Uh, I've been talking about it from the very beginning. It's what I've always believed was going to happen. And I've done my best to show you the wires of this. And in the very least, I've done my best to show you that even if there is no controlled demolition, there is going to be a collapse anyways because the system is so warped and destroyed by debt. So what this book actually does is provide us with a key piece of the puzzle that I have not been able to find myself. But I have had my own suspicions, but... This book really lays it out. It shows a key piece of the puzzle. Uh, I first heard about this on Doug Casey's take. So Matt and Doug have a fantastic YouTube channel over there. And they did an episode about this just the other day. It was about 15 minutes where they gave their take on it. They both read it. I, I read it immediately the next morning. I read it in one sitting. I couldn't put it down. And afterwards, I felt exhausted. Uh, and I needed a stiff drink and I think if you're going to watch this episode I would advise you get three stiff drinks ready one for right now before you hear the subject to get you ready one whilst you're reading it and probably one at the end as well to put you to sleep because you might struggle to sleep after hearing this one so I'm going to leave it there for the introduction I'm not going to be editing this one we're going to do it Bill O'Reilly style, we're going to do it live. We're just going to go straight into this one. And hopefully, I'll pick up on all of the key topics. I've got a little list in front of me. So, um, we'll be bouncing back and forth between this screen and the screen with the um, camera. So, we're going to do that now. We're going to go to it, and I'm going to get my websites open. Oh, hey, <laughs> here we go. Let's, uh, let, let's get ourselves into a light mood. Get your stiff drink ready, and uh, we'll just get ourselves into a nice, mellow mood, because after that, it's all downhill I'm afraid to say we will leave you with a I can't do it okay. we'll do it live okay. well, no. we'll do it live fuck it do it live I can I'll write it and we'll do it live there we go that's me tonight I, I'm, I'm Mr. Bill O'Reilly we're gonna do it live okay so the first thing that I want to show you is the website thegreattaking.com the book was written by a man named David Rogers Webb. Now, that not might not mean a lot to most people because I don't think David Rogers Webb is somebody that has ever sought publicity. He is certainly a very accomplished person, according to the prologue, which we're going to get into in a second. But if you go to thegreattaking.com, you can find his book. It's for free. He's put this out as, an, as a matter of public service, I would say. And you can download the PDF or you can buy a soft copy from a website if you really want to. But I would advise you just get it. It's only 130 pages long. You can read it in a couple of hours and then you can reread it again and again and again if you want to. Going into the backstory of this person, David Webb. So he tells you in the first chapter and I'm going to lay it out kind of step by step. So don't worry, we're going to get to it, the main part of it. But I just want to tell you a little bit about the author so far as we know. He was somebody that was managing money. He came from just a regular background. He appears to have been right up there with the best of them in terms of hedge fund uh, management. He has a few uh, incidences throughout his career where he was in the presence of people like George Soros. He got offered a position at the Rothschilds. He was managing billions and he took funds from, uh, he says he took funds from, 30, 40, 50 million, all the way up to the billions. So clearly a very accomplished person. Now, of course, you might say, well, maybe he's a fraud, maybe he's a liar. I'm a pretty good damn researcher. Uh, I can usually find that kind of stuff out. I didn't go crazy on this one because the book itself is what we're focusing on, not on the author. But I did do a little bit of research and I found an article uh, from 2003, February the 4th. You can see up here that it says Web strikes out with new hedge fund and it talks about how this fund manager called David Webb, same name, 
hopes to raise about $1 billion in assets for his various investment, investment management, which also includes about two dozen of his former colleagues. And it talks about how this Mr. Webb, who was 43, David Webb, he prefers to stay out of the limelight, which would actually uh, resonate with what the author of this book, The Great um, the great taking says he says that I preferred to stay out the limelight, and he also talks about. It also says that he has a great reputation for delivering double-digit returns, and people were scrambling to put money with him. Now, interestingly, when I read his book, if you go to the early chapters where he's talking about his past, he does actually mention that in two thousand and what year is it? Two thousand and three. He set up his own fund. And he did it in January 2003. And what he says actually in the article is that it's February 2003 and that this man, David Webb, has just set up his own fund. So that would actually line up precisely with where this David Webb was putting his own timeline. So I just wanted to put that out there just to say that I did do a little bit of due diligence just to look into it. And it does seem to me like David Webb is a legitimate person. Surprisingly, there's actually a lot of David Webbs in finance. There's a number of people out there who are quite high up, but I do think this person is who he says he is, at least from first glance. He certainly knows his stuff. As I went through the text, uh, he's clearly extremely bright. I would love to speak to this man. He's clearly an extraordinary talent, uh, somebody who has managed an awful lot of money and done extremely well. So I just wanted to give a little bit of a biography on the author. When I read the book, he was making some extremely good market observances which i don't think just your average person is going to know so i i'll leave it there for that one okay so let's go to the next part of it so what is the book actually about well the book is telling a story that david actually uncovered himself through his own work and what he's talking about is that there was a number of things that he started to notice in terms of the legislation around securities and we're talking equities so stocks but also bonds as well, but particularly he's talking about equities, which really alarmed him. And what this legislation was doing is it was turning the equities that you own. So let's say that you have a stock portfolio. You've got a load of silver and gold miners. I would imagine that you assume that you have property rights over those shares, that you have been given property rights. That's what we all assume. And what David shows in his book to start with, because he goes through it, step by step by step but he shows that to start with that's actually not true the law has been changed the law has been changed so now you have an interest in those equities now what does that mean well i would say it's the same as property rights in the uk in the uk if you look at the land laws the registry what you find is that people don't own their land or house outright it's actually owned by the crown whoever the crown are to you some people believe it's the king some people believe that the king is just a puppet for financial interests. And if you go back throughout history, financial history, you'll find that that was the case ever since the glorious revolution, as it's called, when, when William and Mary were put on the throne, William of Orange. And after that point, it was the moneyed men that were in charge of England. Now, we know that. I've just done an episode on the formation of the Bank of England on my podcast, the Parallel Mike podcast. And if you listen to that, you'll find out that story. So in England, it is actually legally not your house. The house is owned by the crown. Now you have an interest in that house, which means you can live there. You can pass it on. It's yours. However, at any point, that house could be confiscated from you because you don't own it. Now, if you don't believe me, you can actually go look at the Land Registry Act of 2002 and you can read it. It says the only absolute land owner in the UK is the crown. No, everyone else has an interest in the land. That means you're a serf on that land. Now, like I said, it's not being enforced right now, but it could be. It could be enforced at any point and you'd have no legal recompense because you wouldn't have anything in law protecting your rights. It's there. Now, if you don't believe me, here's another example. If you died tomorrow in the UK and you had no heir to pass on the house to, do you know where it goes? It goes back to the crown because it's their land and their house originally in law, so it goes straight back to them. Then they can sell it, then they can use it. Now, I know I'm getting off topic, but I just want to put something out there. I want to make it clear that the law matters. Legislation is extremely important because if you look at the legislation, that is how it will be followed in a time of crisis, such as a person dying with no heir. 
Well, where does it go? Well, it goes to the law and they look at it and they say, okay, now it's actually going to go to the original owner of that land, which is the crown. Then they can sell it. They can do what they want with it. So you need to understand these things, that the law is what everything else rests upon. So any new legislation that we are not aware of makes us ignorant of what might happen to us in the future. And that's what David is pointing out in this um, episode that I'm going to be talking about in his book, The Great Taking. He's pointing out that the legislation has been silently and quietly changed over the past few decades to make it so that all of your equities are now like that land that at any point they can be taken from you and used in another way that you are not aware of. It's not your property anymore. Now, this is far more consequential probably than the Land Act in Great Britain because we have a stock market that is about to collapse. We've got a Fiat Ponzi scheme. I've shown you the pyramid many times. In fact, I'll put the pyramid up. I will do a little bit of editing. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to do a tiny bit of editing. But I'm going to put the Ponzi pyramid up because I want to show you just how this one looks. In fact, let's get it up now. Okay, so we've got this graphic in front of us. And this is one that I made, but it's based on John Exeter's pyramid. And I just updated it as to how I saw it in the modern era. And you can see at the top, there is derivatives and unfunded liabilities of two to four quadrillion. Well, why it matters that the legislation around equities has been changed is because this pyramid is now set to collapse. Everyone who has been watching my channel will be well aware of this. And if you're not aware of it, you can go back and watch the previous episodes on this Ponzi pyramid. I've got an episode called Pyramids of Ponzi or something along those lines. You can find that and you can find out what this pyramid represents. But what you have to understand is at the top, there is an awful lot of these things called derivatives. Now, to give you an example of what a deriv derivative is, a derivative is essentially a financial instrument for which there is no underlying collateral or backing. So, for example, let's take this uh, gold bracelet here. This gold bracelet is a one ounce gold bracelet. It's mine. I own it. However, somebody else could come along and they could say, oh, I see that gold bracelet. I'm going to make a bet with my friend that the value of that gold bracelet goes up. And his friend could say, no, I think it's going to go down in the next uh, six months, let's say, for example. Uh, and then they could make a bet on it. They don't actually own the gold bracelet. I own the gold bracelet, but they're making a bet on it. That's a derivative. That's a very simple way of looking at a derivative. Now, there is no limit to the amount of derivatives that can be made, and there is no limit to the amount of different trades. And if you think about all of the different trades that could be made, we've got commodities, we've got equities, we've got interest rates, bonds, all of those things. We've got probably trillions of different trades that could be made, different ideas for trades. Well, derivatives are being made constantly on all of the commodity complex, on all of the equities. On the whole investment sphere, there are derivatives being made. And those derivatives have no backing. So the, pay the people making those bets don't actually own the underlying stuff. Now, the problem with that, of course, is most of these derivatives are actually being done by banks that hold your deposits. So that means that it's not just two people and if one of them fails, the other one has to lump it and they lose their money because the other person's gone bankrupt. No, these are the banks that contain all of the world's wealth and deposits. And if just one of those banks goes down, let's take Dirty Deutsche Bank, for example. Dirty Deutsche Bank have about 60, 70 trillion in derivatives. Now, just to put that into context, the world's GDP in 2011, this is something that's written in this book, The Great Taking, was about 76 trillion. So just one bank has derivatives to the value of the entire world's GDP just a few years back. I think today we're closer to 100 and, 110, 120. Now, if you imagine all of these banks have these derivatives, what happens in a financial crisis? Well, those derivative portfolios blow up. Now, all it would take is just for one of those banks to go under and this whole debt Ponzi pyramid in front of you would collapse from the top down those derivative books would blow up. That would blow up the banking sector because all of those derivatives have counterparties. So that means if one person defaults, the whole system defaults. It's so interconnected. This is the hyper-financialization and deregulization of the system that has taken place when they repealed Glass-Steagall. This is why the system now is rigged to fail. So if just one of those banks goes, the whole thing goes. That's it. The financial system of the world has gone. Now, I know this, and I think you know this too, and they know this. And that's the important thing to understand. They know this. They understand that the system they've created is set to fail. And after 2008, when they took interest rates to record lows, they inflated the everything bubble. They took us to the end game. They knew where this was going. And so they have been setting up for that end game. They've been setting up for the collapse of Exeter's Pyramid, which you can see in front of you. 
and they're now getting ready for the next system, which we know will be central bank digital currencies and a complete rewriting of the social contract. In fact, they're trying to take us back to what is called the Great Reset. And the Great Reset is essentially a form of neo serfdom And if you understand that that's what the Great Reset is about, is about destroying you and taking you back to a form of neo serfdom where you have an elite class, a very small elite class that own everything. They own all the land, they own all the resources, they own all the means of production. And then they're going to use that ownership to enslave you because they're going to tell you what you can and can't have. And they're going to put you in a system. And now they've got the technology added to that system. So if you go back to Soviet Russia, they tried to dominate people's lives totally. But it was very difficult because they didn't have the technology. So they had to use lots of spies, listening devices. But ultimately, people could get out of it in many different ways. Well, that's not going to be the case this time. So they're setting up for that. And if you see that, then you'll also understand that something has to be done to ensure that everyone goes down with the collapse of the pyramid. That's the goal. It has to be because you can only enslave people if they are dependent on you. If they don't need you, if they've got wealth, well, they're going to be fine. So the trick is going to be getting people trapped inside this pyramid. And this is where the great taking comes in. So I had to do this introduction for people who are not aware of what's going on, just as a preamble. Now let's get to the book. Okay, so I'm just going to read you a passage from chapter one. This is the introduction, and I'm going to actually read you the quote that he had. He adds a lot of Sun Tzu quotes, and for people who haven't read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, I would strongly suggest you read that book because it might help you make a little bit more sense of what's happening right now with this epistemological war against us, the masses of humanity. And the quote goes like this. Supreme excellence consists of breaking the enemy's resistance without fighting. Very simple. The easiest way to win is to not face your opponent directly, is to break them before they even know they're in battle. Okay, here's what he's got to say. What is this book about? It's about the taking of collateral. All of it. The end game of this globally synchronous debt accumulation super cycle. This is being executed by long-planned intelligent design, the audacity and scope of which is difficult for the mind to encompass. Included at all financial assets, all money on deposit at banks, all stocks and bonds, all inventories, plant and equipment, land, mineral deposits, inventions and intellectual property, privately owned personal and real property financed with any amount of debt will similarly be taken as will the assets of privately owned businesses, which have been financed with debt. If even partially successful, this will be the greatest conquest and subjugation in world history. We are now living within a hybrid war conducted almost entirely by deception and thus designed to achieve war aims with little energy input. It is a war of conquest directed not against other nation states, but against all of humanity. Now, another part of this book that I just wanted to refer back to is in the prologue where he talks about his meeting with George Soros in the early 2000s, because this is actually quite relevant. I carried into the meeting a single piece of paper. This was a graph showing that the growth rate of US capital spending had blown through five standard deviations above the mean. That's significant. Having never in history broken above three. I explained that this meant there would inevitably be a historic bust. Soros looked closely at the paper, then he looked at me and he said, this is good. He studied the paper further, looked at me again and said, this is very good. He did not disagree with me about the bust, but he did say, they cannot allow equity culture to fail. I said, what can they do that they haven't already done? He said in answer, you don't know what they can do. So in such a moment, even George Soros spoke of they. Who are they? That's an important question. Who are they? Who are the people that control this? Again, I've done episodes on this on my podcast. I, I can only speak about it so much because, let's face it, nobody actually truly knows who they are. We can look at how certain things were done. We can see the hallmarks of they. We can see the clues and the trail of they. But ultimately, there is probably a certain amount of distance you want to keep yourself from whoever they actually are. What we do know is that they have created the largest Ponzi scheme in human history and the collapse of this scheme is going to be used to 
head us all into a totalitarian future. And that is something that this person, uh, David Webb, mentions multiple times in this book. Now, another thing that I just want to point out before we get into the actual equities part is that one of the key metrics that David measures as a market analyst is the velocity of money. And he talks about how throughout history, the velocity of money has been telling us when we are heading towards a out and out crash. So he talks here about in the early 19th century leading up to the Great War, there was a collapse in the velocity of money. We saw it collapse. Then within a few years, the Russian, Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman Empire ceased to exist. Now, in my recent episode of the podcast, I talk about how when the Bank of England was first created, following that, Britain was used to start the mechanisms that would bring down other nations that were on debt-free systems. I'm talking about systems where there was no central bank lending, fiat money at interest. And it just so happens that Russia was one of them and also the Austro-Hungarian Empire was another. So it's interesting that that was the uh, trajectory of war after Britain got the Bank of England. So you have to understand that story to understand how we got to where we are and also to understand the arc of history goes on to say, the German economy was destroyed, then following that we had the Great Depression, the Second World War, and the slow collapse of the British Empire. No populations were unscathed, and there were no winners, or were they? While there was widespread deprivation, selected banking interest took the collateral of thousands of banks which were forced to close, as well as of a great many people and businesses large and small, the indebted. In the US, gold held by the public was confiscated, but most importantly, closely held security, private control of central banks and money creation was maintained, as was the aforementioned control of a society's key institutions, including political parties, governments, intelligence agencies, armed forces, police, major corporations and media. And I will add to that, that after the Second World War was when we had this host of global institutions, the NGOs, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, they were all formed on the back of this. So that was when we started to go to this global system, which right now is looking to be the global system that's going to be supplanting all of our nation's sovereignty. So it's interesting, you have to understand the timeline here. So look at this chart here on the velocity of money, just to highlight David's point. And again, like I said, it kind of identifies that David really does know what he's talking about. The first collapse you can see here was going into the Panic of 1907. The Panic of 1907 was something that was orchestrated by the banking cartels. So we're talking the major banking houses, the Warbergs, the Rothschilds, the people who controlled the Bank of England and were desperate to set up the Federal Reserve or a central bank in America. They were not happy that they had been rebuffed by the politicians numerous times. They'd had a number of attempts at creating a central bank and failed. This is actually part two of my most recent podcast for members. I go into the entire history of central banking in the US. It was an epic episode uh, and I think you'll really love it. So if you're interested, please do check that out because it will give you a lot of information. But what happened was they orchestrated the panic of 1907, then used that as justification to the nation that a central bank was needed. Of course, they had their little meeting on Jekyll Island in 1910. All of the world's international financiers were there where they conspired to create the Federal Reserve and that was done just a few years later in 1913. What happened after that? Well, we had World War I where it just so happened that all of the gold uh, outside of the US got sent to the US. So that really did capitalize the Federal Reserve. It gave it a lot of gold. Isn't that interesting? Just a few years later, all of the Wall Street firms, yes, they made a mint too. They made a killing on World War One. It was very, very lucrative. Then what did we have? Remember, the Federal Reserve said when they were making their charter that they would have a period now of prosperity with no booms and busts while we had the Roaring Twenties and then the greatest financial collapse in modern history leading to the Great Depression, which absolutely wiped out millions of families. And we're actually gonna talk about that later in the show. But I just wanted to show you this chart. It just gives you, again, a little bit more credence that this person who wrote this book really does know what he's talking about. Although it doesn't actually matter because everything in this book, The Great Taking, is cited. You can actually go and have a look at all of the original source documents so that you know this person is telling you the truth. He's not making it up. 
Now, if you look at this chart here, you can see the velocity of the M2 money stock as it stands right now. It starts in 1960. Just look at this. The velocity of money has been collapsing ever since 2008. In fact, it started to collapse after the dot-com crash and it never recovered. It's been collapsing ever since. So how has the global financial system survived since 2000? How have they managed to survive when the velocity of money has been collapsing? Well, I'll tell you how. This is how. Money creation. If you go here, 2000, look at that. And look how high the money creation has gone since the year 2000. That's how the money creation has been going up. The velocity of money has been going down. Now, that's been good because as the velocity of money went down, it stopped hyperinflation because velocity of money is absolutely critical to a hyperinflation. It's when the velocity of money gets very, very high. But what you have to understand is we are reaching record lows for the velocity of money. And they're only going to be able to paper over that but what's going to happen now is inflation is going to take off. So velocity of money will start to rise, but that will be going into a hyperinflation. The only other option is an out and out debt, debt collapse. And that would be this coming crashing down. Now, ultimately, that's where it goes. Whether they can squeeze in a hyperinflation first, well, that's up to you to decide. Do they just veer us off the cliff into a debt collapse? They could do if they are ready to do that, if the system is rigged and ready to go then they might decide to do that. You shouldn't ever discount the fact they could do that. People think it's only hyperinflation. No, they might do the hyperinflation first to buy some, buy themselves some time. That's what I think if I had to edge one side, but I wouldn't put anything past it. If they're ready to go, if they've got a plan, could be that a cyber pandemic happens and brings down the system, then it goes straight to a debt collapse. So we have to, have to, have to be thinking risk management because we could go left or right here. Nobody actually truly knows. All we know is the whole thing has become quite psychotic. We're in the really crazy psycho stage. And we know that because look what happened between 2020 and 2022. And look at what continues to happen. We are living in the period of permanent crisis. The velocity of money has now contracted to a lower level than at any point during the Great Depression and World Wars. Once the ability to produce growth by printing money has been exhausted, creating more money will not help. It is pushing on a string. The phenomenon is irreversible. And so, perhaps announcement of the Great Reset has been motivated not by global warming or by profound insights into a fourth industrial revolution, but rather by certain knowledge of the collapse of the fundamental monetary phenomena, the implications of which extend far beyond economics. Something has been planned for us, but not for the reasons you have been given. How might we come to know something about the intentions of the planners? perhaps by examining their preparations. And so now that is where we will go to. And we're going to start with the chapter number three, security entitlement. Now, this is extremely important. The greatest subjugation in world history will have been made possible by the invention of a construct, a subterfuge, a lie, the security entitlement. So what does that mean? Well, I'm just going to read you this quote here and then I'm going to go through it step by step. Let's say that you have purchased a vehicle outright for cash. Having no debt against the vehicle, you believe that you now own it outright. Despite this, the auto dealer has been allowed by a newly invented legal concept to treat your car as his asset and to use it as collateral to borrow money for his own purposes. Now, the auto dealer has become bankrupt and your vehicle, along with all the others sold by the dealer, are seized by certain secured creditors of the dealership, with no judicial review being necessary, as legal certainty was previously established that they have absolute power to take your car in the event of bankruptcy of the dealer. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about your car. I'm illustrating the horror and simplicity of the lie. You are led to believe that you own something, but someone else secretly controls it as collateral and they now have established legal certainty that they have absolute power to take it immediately in the event of insolvency, and not your insolvency, but insolvency of the people who secretly gave them your property as collateral to begin with. It does not seem possible, but this is exactly what has been done with all tradable financial instruments globally. The proof of this is absolutely irrefutable. The whole thing is wired to go now. So, this is laying out the case that all equities, every single stock that you think you own, is no longer your private property. And he goes on to explain, and I'm not going to go through all of the legal documents because I think you owe it to yourself to read this one for yourself. But trust me, I've looked at the documents 
firsthand and he's absolutely correct. What has happened, there's no absolute ownership anymore. What you have is a security entitlement. And what that means is that you can own the security, you've got an interest in the security, but it's not absolutely yours, which means other things can be done with it. Now, what are those other things? Well, that is where we're gonna to go to next. And here he lays out the key facts. Ownership of securities as property have been replaced with a new legal concept of a security entitlement, which is a contractual claim assuring a very weak position if the account provider becomes insolvent. All securities are held in unsegregated pooled form. Securities used as collateral and those restricted from such use are held in the same pool. So here's a really interesting part. Essentially, when you buy a stock, when you buy some shares, let's example, for example, you buy 100 shares in Newmont. Your provider, let's imagine it's Hardgreave Lansdowne, that's one of the biggest in Britain. Let's imagine your provider, you put the order through with them. They now buy the shares, but those shares are not handed to you in a segregated account. Those shares are not yours. They're not locked in some kind of vault with your name on it. Those shares are added to a pool. And all of the owners of those shares have their shares in there too. So anyone else who has bought it, and I shouldn't use the term owner actually, all of the other people who have a security entitlement, all of their shares, so let's imagine a thousand of us buy a hundred shares today. All of our shares are now pulled in this giant pool. Now, that means that nothing is exclusively yours and that pool now has other people with claims over it that can use those shares for other things that's what he's talking about your shares are in a pool so you might see them on your screen as part of your portfolio that's just showing you what you have an entitlement to all account holders including those who have prohibited use of their securities as collateral must by law receive only a pro rata share of residual assets we're going to get to the collateral thing in a moment. Revindication, i.e. taking back of one's own securities in the event of insolvency, is absolutely prohibited. Now, this person, David Webb, he has extensively searched for a get-out where he could have his shares in his own possession, that his shares would not be a part of this system. And what he found was that across the entirety of the world, in the US, in Canada, and in Europe, Everyone has changed their legislation to be in line with one another. That's the key. That's the trick, actually. That's the setup. That's the big red flag. Account providers may legally borrow pooled securities as collateral to collateralize proprietary trading and financing. So what does that mean? Well, that means that all of those shares in that pool can now be used by other people, more important people than you or I. Now, what are they using it for? Well, they're using it as collateral for other things. So they can put it up for collateral, for example, for a loan or for a trade with another bank for a derivatives position. doesn't matter. They've got priority. It's not your stuff. It's not your money. It's like when you put your cash in a bank. It's the same thing. When you put your cash in a bank now, what, do you, what did you learn from my channel about bank bail-ins? The legislation is already there. So in the event of a financial crisis, that cash is not yours. That's marked. It's earmarked for somebody else. It's in law now. So they're setting us up for the collapse of the system and they're putting you at the very bottom, which means you'll get nothing. You will own nothing. And will you be happy? I don't think you will be. Time for another stiff drink. Safe Harbor assures secured creditors priority claim to pull securities ahead of count, account holders. So this means that there are secured creditors. These are the priority. Now, who do you think they might be? Well, those are the big banks, the JP Morgans, the Deutsche Bank, and I'm guessing an elite list of clients at the very top. They are the ones, that is the they that George Soros spoke about. Those are the ones to whom everything will go in the collapse. The absolute priority claim of secured creditors to pulled client securities has been upheld in the courts. There's legal precedent and he shows that in this book. Account providers are legally empowered to borrow pooled securities without restriction. This is called self-help. <laughs> oh my. As we will see, the objective is to utilize all securities as collateral. So what you'll find is that they have given very interesting terms to this whole process. So they use things like words, self-help, harmonization. That sounds really nice. Who doesn't need a bit of self-help and a bit of harmonization? Well, let me assure you, the harmonization is the first part we're going to be focusing on, the harm. 
And he has this conversation here that he prints and it's from a March 2006 meeting with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and it provides a detailed response to a questionnaire prepared by the Legal Certainty Group. And they were looking to the Fed to tell them exactly how they do it. So we're talking about this collateralization and it says this. Question. Where securities are held in pooled form? for example, a collective securities position rather than a segregated individual position, does the investor have rights attaching to particular securities in the pool? So if you're in that pool, if you bought some shares, do you have special rights relating to your securities that you own in that pool? Fed answer, no. <laughs> no, that's it. No, there's a little bit more. The security entitlement holder has a pro rata share of the interest in the financial asset held by its securities intermediary. This is true even if investor positions are segregated. Question. Is the investor protected against the insolvency of an intermediary and if so, how? Fed. An investor is always vulnerable to a securities intermediary that does not itself have interest in a financial asset sufficient to cover all of the securities entitlements that it has created in that financial asset. If the secured creditor, again that key term, who's the secured creditor, who are they? If the secured creditor has control over the financial asset, it will have priority over entitlement holders. If the securities intermediary is a clearing corporation, the claims of its creditors have priority over the claims of entitlement holders. Okay, so that's important to understand that this has all been laid out, it's all been discussed, and over the past 20 years, it's been ramping up till the point they got their ironclad legislation in place to ensure that everyone's assets are going to be pulled. Now, what you have to understand is this pool is no longer just your broker pooling its own assets. No, no, no. This pool is a global pool. They've created a system where all of the assets are put into this global pool from which the secured creditors, i.e. the mega banks and these uh, special interests, can take those shares and use them as collateral against the collapse of this pyramid here, against the collapse of two to four quadrillion in derivatives. So what you have to understand is they've created a system where they can go into this system at any point and take shares from that system and put it up as collateral. And those shares could come from South Korea, they could come from New York, they could come from uh, Liverpool in Britain, they could come from anywhere. They can just take those shares from any country at any point. Now what you have to understand is that there is no backing for this. So you have no insurance. In fact, they created something that they're going to say is insurance in the event that that system fails, which of course it would in a market collapse. If you have two to four quadrillion in derivatives that are blowing up, no amount of money on planet Earth could backstop that. So that means everything will get sucked in to the collateralization. Just think about that for a second. Absolutely everything, every debt, every house, every equity, every bond, every piece of equipment that a factory or business owns that has been bought on finance, absolutely everything is now being set up to be collateralized, it's all being put into this system, then in the event of a financial crisis, all of that stuff that I've just mentioned, all the houses, stocks, bonds, everything, everything will then be drawn out by the secured creditors to use as collateral. So what this suggests to me is that there is somebody at the very top of a pyramid. Everything else sits underneath of it all of the banking institutions, all of the brokerage firms, everything sits underneath that, all of the banks. It doesn't stop at the banks. There's somebody at the top, a secured creditor. They own everything underneath it. And they have now a big, massive collateral base. So when the system fails, all of that collateral will then go to the banks. So it will go to all of these mega banks. And if you've got two to four quadrillion in derivatives and all the other stuff, there will be no amount of collateral that can fulfill those failed contracts, there's too much debt in the system. So that means all of that collateral goes to who? Well, it will go to the banks, but then it will go to the secured creditors at the top. Somebody in the shadows, I guess. They'll own everything, you'll own nothing. Now, you can ignore that part of it, because even if it just goes out of your hands, that means everything is taken from you, the whole lot. Anything that you do not own outright will be taken from you. Time for another stiff drink. Okay, but let's get back to this one. I told you you'd need one. In fact, I lied. I said you'd need three. I think you'll probably need more than three. Let's get back to this one. I've got some more quotes here. 
Some markets treat securities like money. The US and Canada base their law on the concept that investors do not own securities, but they own securities entitlements against their account providers instead. The advantage of this concept is the potential increase in the amount of assets available as collateral, but critics view it as a threat to stability of the system because the assets consent are based on the same underlying resource. And this is from a document that was um, from the European Commission's Directorate General Internal Market and Services from 2012. So they was discussing this. As a result of the demand for collateral, securities are increasingly regarded by market participants as a funding tool. So that's not your investment, that's somebody else's funding tool. These trends reinforce the market trends to treat securities like money with significant implications for ownership. <laughs> I'd say so. This works well until a bankruptcy occurs. If the account provider defaults, a client with a mere contractual claim becomes an unsecured creditor. Let me just repeat that. It works well until bankruptcy occurs. So it works well when everything is normal. But the moment we have problems, it doesn't work. So it doesn't really work well, does it? And it's like, it's like you married. My marriage worked well until I had an affair. You know, it doesn't really work like that. You have to look at both sides. And it says, if the account provider defaults, a client with a mere contractual claim becomes an unsecured creditor, meaning the client's assets are, as a rule, tied in the insolvency estate, and it is obliged to line up with all other unsecured creditors to receive its assets back. You're not getting those assets back. 100% you are not getting those assets back. When this Ponzi scheme collapses, and I've got to keep, I'm so glad I've got this graphic because I need to keep showing, this is the perfect graphic for tonight's episode. When this collapses, there is no going back. The only way back from this would be a global revolution, a la Bob Moriarty, what he said in his recent interview on my show. That's the only way out of this, would be a global revolution whereby every legal structure is torn down because the only thing that would allow us to get back any semblance of wealth would be to disregard and destroy every legal structure on planet Earth because it is the legal structures that are being used to enslave you. That's why the law is so important because everything is owned through the law. All of the land in the UK is owned by the Crown. How? Through the law. All of this system, all of this collateral that they're going to rob, how's it happening? Through the law. So the only way out of this would be a global revolution and war to destroy every single institution and structure on planet Earth to start again. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like fun time. <laughs> that sounds like a difficult future. And of course, I've been talking about the potential for that here on the channel, but I think probably this episode is really going to bring it home for some people. So another stiff drink. And he ends it by saying this. Clearly, the European Union Directorate General Internal Market and Services fully knew the above in 2012. In the next global financial panic, what are the chances that there will be much of anything remaining in these pools of securities after the secured creditors have helped themselves? There will be a game of musical chairs. When the music stops, you will not have a seat. It's designed to work that way. Chapter 4, Harmonization. And we've got another Sun Tzu quote here. Those skilled at making the enemy move do so by creating a situation to which he must conform. They entice him with something he is certain to take. And with lures of ostensible profit, they await him in strength. What was the purpose of seemingly out of control financialization? What was the purpose of creating this? This didn't have to happen. We had Glass-Steagall in place, but before that, we had systems built around sound money. If you go back to the medieval period, there was a 500-year period where prices pretty much didn't go anywhere. Commodities went up and down only based on demand and supply, but it wasn't based on the monetary system. It wasn't based on fiat money inflating the system. So people could earn a good salary. In fact, if you go back to Roman times, it cost about seven ounces of silver to buy your annual food. And if you fast forward the next 1500 years to medieval England, the same thing was true. Seven ounces of silver would still buy you your annual food. So what changed? Well, I'll tell you what changed. Central banking and fiat money. The banksters have done this to us. But why did we allow it to get so hyper-financialized? Why is every pension in the UK not in real assets, not in things that cannot be destroyed. Why is every pension in the UK, the entire future wealth that people are going to depend on when they retire, 
what they believe is going to give them a happy retirement where they can spend time with their family, with their grandkids, they can go on holiday, they can play a bit of golf. That's the dream. That's what they have been lured with their entire life to push themselves to do a job that they can't stand, a career that takes them away from their family, from raising their own children. That is the one hope, the one dream. Why did we allow that whole thing, that whole future, all those dreams and hopes to be put into a Ponzi system and everything else? Well, I'll tell you why. It was for this. It was for what comes next. It was knowing that that would allow a certain group to take all of the wealth whilst that system was in play and then leave everyone else with nothing. And he continues, an imperative has been created that certain secured creditors must be given legal certainty to claims of clients' assets globally without exception, with the further assurance of near instantaneous cross-border mobility of legal control of such collateral. The global push for conformance to the US model for achieving such certainty and mobility began in earnest more than 20 years ago in the aftermath of the dot-com bust. Financial instability and the threat of collateral shortages were used as justification. Deliberate efforts were sustained globally over many years. People were paid to do this to betray the vital interests of their own people. It was done first in the US and then demanded globally under the name of harmonization. Perhaps the emphasis should be on harm. The Hague Convention on the law applicable to certain rights in respect of securities held with an intermediary was drafted in 2002 and signed in 2006. It is an international multilateral treaty intended to remove globally legal uncertainties for cross-border securities transactions. So just to explain, the idea was created and then the effort was put in place to ensure that the whole world would be a part of this system. One world system. Sound familiar? Well, yeah, this is the one world system that's going to happen in the collapse. It's all going to become very real very quickly because everyone has already drafted and installed the legislation. It's there. It's been done. The I's are dotted. The T's are crossed. It's done. The convention introduced a newly invented conflict of laws rule to be applied to security transactions, especially collateral transactions, namely the place of the relevant intermediary approach or PREMA. This was designed to avoid problematic national law. That tricky national law. They don't like national law, do they? Which might allow owners to recover their assets taken by a creditor as collateral by setting the place of law in the account agreements with intermediaries. That means that you have signed up to this without knowing. When you have signed up with your account. In fact, what I would advise you do is tomorrow, call up your broker and ask them, write down the names of these laws and legislations Ask them, what would happen in the event of a default? Ask them, are my assets being used as collateral? And make sure you get official documents from them telling you. You want something on a piece of paper. I guarantee you they won't give you it. And I don't think the person on the phone will tell you either. But just do it as an experiment and get back in touch with me. It'd be really good to know that. I can tell you I've already checked uh, and I can find nothing. I can find nothing. All I can find is the laws, but I can't find nothing in the accounts. But I would imagine that I signed up to that unknowingly. The objective of legal certainty for creditors was to be pursued by other means, where they could not easily change problematic local law in which investors had property rights to securities. They structured around it. That is what lawyers, investment bankers, and apparently government officials are paid to do. And he talks here about the steps that were in place. Like I said, I think you need to read this one for yourself. I'm not going to go into it. But he does mention here, that he actually tried to warn people in 2014. And he says that he had arranged to speak at a hedge fund conference in Zurich. And he told professionals all about this. And he says that when he finished speaking, there was complete silence. And in the coffee break that followed, he asked one of the people, so what are you going to do about it? Because he was hoping to drum up some kind of activism to change this because, of course, it's absolutely diabolical. And the person said that, yes, he understood. But when asked what he was going to do about it, he said nothing. And when asked why, why are you going to do nothing? He said, my clients don't know about this, so they don't care about it. Simple. They don't care about it because they don't know about it. Now, now you do know about it. So this is probably our only shot. Our only chance is to share this message. And I would share this video. Go watch Doug and Matt on Doug Casey's take. Listen to their take on it. Go read the book, share the book with people. That's what you have to do. Um, that's all we can do. 
Then it talks about the Central Security Depository, which sounds like a, a, an American three-letter agency. And speaking of three-letter agencies, he did actually mention in this uh, book that he wrote, David, that he was speaking about this publicly and he got invited by a person to go uh, have a meal with him to discuss his ideas and this whole topic. So he did and he went and he explained everything. They spoke for hours. Then the person said, would you like to go for a beer with me? So he said, sure. David went for a beer with him. Then in the middle of the conversation, the man just stopped and looked him dead in the eye and said, does your family know that you're sharing this information? Uh, and he was essentially giving him a warning and that was the end of the meeting, just like that. Uh, and it seems like this person was probably from intelligence. So that tells us something too. That tells us that this information, they don't want people to know this information, it seems. Uh, like I said, you can read the book yourself. You can take take what you want from it. I'm just giving you the information. So it says here, the central security depository. Well, this is a pivotal part of it because what they've essentially done is create a massive database so that everything can be harmonized and this whole system can be looked at from a 10,000 foot view and they can start to move, uh, extract all that collateral, extract all of your assets and put them wherever they want. That's what this system's all about. So there's the national ones. So every country now has one of these. And then there's the international one, the ICSD. And it says here it's linked to national CSDs and it handles securities lending and collateral management. Did you know that existed? Did any of us? I never. It goes on to say, as noted by European Securities and Market Authority, CSDR plays a pivotal role for post-trade harmonization efforts in Europe and it enhances the legal and operational conditions for cross-border settlements in the EU. Now, I'm not going to go into that one uh, too much, but I did want to show you this document here. What you can see here is how it works. He shows, uh, this is from the Bank of International Settlements. He adds this to his document and it shows you how they are using this and it takes you through it step by step. You can find this in his footnotes. It's very well footnoted and this is how it's working now. So you can see on this chart here how it's all working. On the top, you've got all of the different market participants. So you've got equities desk in Tokyo, fixed income desk Tokyo in London, derivatives desk in London, equities desk in New York. Now, these are the people that we're buying our financial investments from. So when we're buying equities, we're buying them from them. Now, when we buy those equities, what they are then doing, you can see if you go to the next level, is they're putting it into this middle part, the collateral management service provider. Now that's like a database. So then they're putting it into the database along with the rights. So we don't have the rights. Our institutions have taken those assets that we've bought and they've put it into this system. Now they're being handed off to another level, to the custodians. Custodian A, custodian B, and custodian C. And you can see there's all these arrows shooting down. So these arrows are going down. And then they're going to the custodians. Now what's happening? Basically what's happening from there is the collateral, which is our assets, is now being given to the collateral takers. So our providers are the collateral givers. And right at the very bottom, you've got the collateral takers. And in between, you've got the mechanisms that they've put in place to move these assets around. Now, who are the collateral takers? Well, you can hear, see here it says repo counterparties. Securities lending counterparties, bilateral de derivative counterparties, counterparties for other trading activities, CCPs for margin requirements. Now, just going back to this, I don't buy derivatives. Why don't I buy derivatives? Because I want to protect myself from those toxic financial products. I don't want to be a part of that. Turns out I am a part of that because any assets that I buy, any equities that I buy are being used as collateral for other people that have zero risk management and they're exposing themselves to God knows what in the derivatives markets. So <laughs> it doesn't really matter about my own risk management in that instance. You know, I can risk manage my portfolio. That's fine. I can do very well with the portfolio until something goes wrong. Then I find out that actually all of those equities are now not there and I can't sell them because they've been handed off as collateral. So you see how it works? This will only transpire once the system comes into some kind of structural damage, once it starts to fall apart. That's when you'll realize all of this actually already existed. You'll wake up, all of a sudden it's gone. He talks here about how all 
securities have been now used as collateral. That was the objective. And hence, to have the real practical means to take all securities as collateral. Comprehensive collateral management systems have been implemented, which assures the transport of all securities cross-border through the mandated linkage of CSDs to ICSDs. So that's the systems. We've got our national ones. We've got the international ones. We've got the puppet masters at the top. We're just sending them left, right, and center. Goes on to say, where the risk of the derivatives complex is concentrated, the supposed demand for this enormous undertaking is not being driven by true market forces, but by regulatory contrivance. Now, this is a really important part because he says that there was no evidence of scarcity for collateral and market participants were not experiencing, experiencing a shortfall, but demand for collateral assets was being artificially created and intensified by regulatory fiat, so it was not market-driven. They were doing this for a purpose. Now, that's key, because what he's showing us is that what's happened has been driven by some force. It wasn't a natural occurrence. It wasn't because there was a need for it. It's because somebody or some group was pushing this forward. And he mentions derivatives here. He says derivatives are financial contracts on everything imaginable and even unimaginable for most of us. They may be modeled on real things, but are not real of themselves. They are untethered from physical reality, but can be used to take real things as collateral. This is the subterfuge, the end game of it all. And I'm going to leave the final words to Mr. David Webb. It's his book, so let's leave the final words to him. He says, In the past few years, you have been living within an escalating hybrid war. Globally, we have witnessed overt media control and propaganda campaigns, censorship, including arrests of people speaking in public, monitoring of all electronic communications and physical contact tracing. Yeah, I can vouch for that. My YouTube channel's trajectory was very high to begin with. It was doing very well, got a lot of support all of a sudden. My ratios and averages went down 40%, 50% because I started to speak about certain political situations. I started to speak out against certain things and ultimately it destroyed the channel. Now I get less viewers than I got when I had the channel for a couple of months and had maybe 10% of the subscribers. What's going on? It's called censorship. You know, that's why I created a podcast and left here. That's why I advise people to join me on my Patreon. Yes, Patreon can disappear, but if you do that, you'll get into my private Telegram group and should anything happen, I will put all of my content on my website. I do have a members section. Right now, it's for part two of my podcast. If you really like my podcast, you can become a member then and get part two. But in the event of out-and-out -out censorship, that will be the last bastion. That'll be where I just put all of my financial stuff as well. I do have Rockfin. I would advise you go to Rockfin and subscribe there because that is the place where people are not being censored right now. Rockfin.com slash Parallel Systems. My podcast is Parallel Mike Podcast. You can download that on any app. And like I said, if you check out my Patreon, even if you just subscribe at the lowest level, but I would subscribe minimum of four pound, then you can get the Telegram group. But even if you just subscribe at the lowest level, at least you will be alerted if anything changes and if this channel disappears. Sadly, that's what we have to do. And we all have a um, obligation to support the things that we like the most. And it doesn't have to be my channel. I'm a member of the channels that I like. Uh, the reason I say this is because this is serious stuff, everyone. Uh, and this could change at any given moment because, you know, there's a lot of parasites uh, in the world. There's a lot of them at the top of this system. We cannot become parasites ourselves. I've actually had experience of that since I started the channel. And uh, sadly, you know, no, we have to all actually uh, contribute in some way. Some people contribute by putting themselves out there and saying these things and putting these things in the media, trying to help one another. Uh, some people contribute nothing, just negativity. Uh, they want everything for free. Uh, people tell me sometimes that my episodes are too long or that they uh, don't like how I do it. It's like, yeah, I don't care. Go away. I don't want parasites. We need to support one another. We need a community to be built. Uh, and ultimately, I'm only interested in people that are willing to build that community alongside me. I'm not interested in people that are just uh, consuming. I need people that are going to take action. Okay, rant really is over now. Uh, it goes on to say, brutally enforced lockdown and requirements for the thing. Like if I say it, I'm probably going to get this video taken down. People being beaten, handcuffed and arrested, even in their own homes, suspension of healthcare services. Uh, it goes on and on. Governments dropped all pretense of democracy. They were emboldened to open despotism. There were no functioning checks on this power. The courts provided no effective recourse to the public. I will make a startling assertion. This is not because the power to control is increasing. It's because the power is indeed collapsing. The control system has entered collapse. Now, you'll have heard me say this many times in the past few weeks, uh, that when this system comes down, when this collapses, that's not increased control. That's a power vacuum. 
The increased control is central bank digital currencies. It's complete dependency. They need the complete dependency because the power vacuum is going to be so big. Their control system ends. That's it. It's over. The whole thing, thousands of years to get to the central banks, all that, it's gone. The system's bankrupt. That is not more power. That's less. That's going to take us to a power vacuum. That is why parallel systems are so important because if we build them now, we will not become completely dependent. Of course, it requires people to be actually thinking and critically thinking to understand what is taking place. And most people, they're not understanding. In fact, they're doing quite the opposite. However, he's absolutely correct in his assertion. The power is going to end for a moment. And that's why they want to usher us as fast as they can into a new system. But look at how many people are starting to take notice. I can say from my uh, Patreon that a lot of people have taken notice the past year or two. Uh, and thank God, you know, that's our best hope. He goes on to say their power has been based on deception. Their two great powers of deception, money and media, have been extremely energy efficient means of control. But these powers are now in rampant collapse. True. You know, people don't watch the old media. The people who do watch it are dying out. The most successful podcast now is Joe Rogan. You know, just think about that for a second. The traditional media is done. It's over. Even the parallel systems broadcast has caught a bit. Even I've got people watching me in my uh, little enclave over here. So that's what's happening. People are finding their tribe. They're finding the people, uh, the individuals who speak to them. You know, so everyone's going to have somebody who resonates more with them. Uh, I talk about certain topics and I talk in a certain way. Other channels talk in a different way. For me, I've mentioned it a few times. I pretty much only watch two shows. I watch Palisades Gold Radio when I've got time. I listen to Doug, and Matt Kay, uh, Doug Casey and Matt Smith. That's it. I don't have time for anyone else. But they speak to me the most. So that's who I watch. We all have the people who speak to us the most. And that is why we're all linking up too. If you look in the alt media, everyone is linking up now. You know, I've linked up with so many cool people the past year, independent reporters, researchers. That's why I got a podcast. I didn't just want to link up with people in finance because unfortunately, there's a lot of people in finance who are as blind as the rest of them. All they care about is money, making more money. They have no interest in freedom. They have no real interest in parallel systems. They have no real interest in understanding what's going on. All it's about is about trading and money. That's not good. That's not going to help us. And those people will probably go down with the system because they won't have self-sufficiency. They won't have the means to grow their own food. They won't have connections you know, across the world with other people who understand what's happening. So that's one of the reasons why I went into a podcast so I could reach out across the spectrum, not just in finance, but to people everywhere. Building a community, an international one. It's absolutely critical. That's what we're doing on my Patreon. That's what other people are doing. Uh, and we're all linking up and it's extremely important. Goes on to say, but these powers are now in rampant collapse. This is why they have moved urgently to institute physical control measures. However, physical control is difficult, dangerous, and energy intensive. And so they are risking all. They are risking being seen. Is it not a sign of desperation? Where will they hide when they have all of the assets? When they have damaged all of humanity and caused billions to awaken through suffering? They promote the belief that they are all powerful. They are not. All they have is the power to print money. The rest they have usurped from humanity. Never before has a system benefited so few at the great expense of so many. Is this not inherently unstable and unsustainable? Physical control as opposed to rule by deception requires enormous energy. Can this be sustained while destroying all economies and abusing all people globally? They do not know how to build back better. Look at their footprint around the world. The destruction, the economic devastation. When it comes to the real world, they are exceptionally good at one thing, effing things up. So I'm going to leave it there for this one. I'm going to just flip my screen around. Back to the graphic. And yeah, so listen, that's a lot to take in. And I would advise you read the book. And ultimately, it doesn't matter whether you own equities or not. That's not the message here. The message here is that the system that we've been looking at, this inverted pyramid, and I always said to people that your equities are going to go down with the ship one way or another. And I used the example of Russia. Uh, recently in Russia, when they went to war, there was a lot of those companies that were no longer able to be traded on the London Stock Exchange. So we're talking Russian companies. I actually owned one of them for a time. And the people in Russia, they got locked out of their brokerage accounts. They couldn't sell. People outside of Russia could sell. They had a set amount of time. And those stocks collapsed overnight. So 85, 90% overnight. Uh, they were trading at just like 5% of the value they were just a few days later. Now, the people in Russia couldn't sell. 
And by the time the stock market in Russia opened again and their brokerage accounts allowed them back in, they'd already been wiped out 95%. There's nothing they could have done. And I actually spoke to somebody. Well, no, sorry, I didn't speak to them. I listened to somebody speak um, who was from Russia. And he said that he got almost wiped out in his equities. You know, not all of them, because some of them didn't, but many of them. And he lost a significant amount of money. Fortunately, he was risk managing and therefore, he managed to survive that and it didn't destroy his portfolio. Now, the key term there is risk management. Does this mean that we sell all of our equities tomorrow? I, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's an extreme position, but this is an extreme situation that we're discussing. How could we survive something like this? Well, I think he's right in his assessment that whatever they try and do, what they are attempting to do is going to fail. That's my honest assessment. You know, I've thought about this. I've thought about a lot of it. I'm very intuitive as a person. And he talks about his own intuition. My intuition is it fails. But how it fails is critical. You can fail in a global takeover and still destroy lots of people. You know, you can still impoverish millions. You can still have uh, millions of people or billions of people perish. There's all kinds of things you can do when you've got the levers of power and you are purposely trying to destroy. Uh, and we've all seen this. You know, I foresaw this a long time ago. I'm sure a lot of people who listen to this channel have foreseen this. And therefore, we've took as much action as possible. So let's just focus mainly on the investment part for now. In terms of the investment part, uh, how would you survive it? Well, ultimately, you really have to go back to Exeter's Pyramid. Uh, I'm going to have to get it up one more time. And this is why this graphic has been so important uh, to me uh, to show this is because if you go back to Exeter's Pyramid, you can see there's something at the bottom, zero counterparty risk. Everything else in that pyramid has counterparty risk. And therefore, it can be used as collateral. Now, you might say, well, I don't have any debt. Well, if you don't have any debt, then yes, that is the most secure above the zero counterparty risk. So I've put at the bottom land, debt-free farmland. It has to be debt-free. If there's debt or mortgages on it, that will be put into the collateralized system. And you don't know where it's going to end. Remember those machines where you put a ball in at the top and there's all the pins and it kind of bounces around and there's the little slots at the bottom. You have no idea which one it's going to land in. Well, that's it. And most of those ones at the bottom are going to be bad. There's like It's going to be like a 1,000 or a 100,000 with lose on it and maybe one with win. Uh, I don't foresee that being a good. So the debt, if there's debt there, it, that should be dealt with. You know, and I'd take that seriously. I'd really think about it. I'm not going to tell people what to do, you know, but you have to think about it. Uh, Debt-free farm on forest, self-sufficient homesteads. I mean, self-sufficient homesteads. Could they come and kick you off your land? They could try. I think there's a lot of people out there where, yeah, that would be the end for them. They'd be like, no, that's this is my place and I'm protecting it. Now, I would point this out. During 2020, they installed some new laws in Great Britain, and I'm sure they did it in other countries. I know they did it in Europe too. They probably did it in the US. I would like to hear, check it out in the US too. But they implemented some new laws where they said if they believe a house if they believe a house has somebody with infectious disease in it, they can tear down the house. <laughs> so this was a part of the draconian new laws that they implemented. They never took it off the books. It's still there. That means they can go to any house and say, oh, you've got whatever it is that we're telling you you've got, the house comes down. Now you're going to live in the city in a smart city. So those things could happen. Yeah, you really have to take notice of what's happening in the world, everyone. You have to take notice of the laws. Uh, I, I don't want to end this one on a downer. I'm going to uh, have one more stiff drink. My final stiff... No, nah, actually, I'm going to go I'm gonna go drink another one. Uh, I've got one in the fridge, and uh, yeah, this is <laughs> stiff drink time for sure. But you really have to think about these things. When it comes to investments, I mean, what can you do? Uh, Matt and Doug, uh, on their show, they talked about investment in real estate. Yes, but I mean, I guess if this future transpires, I mean... No one's going to be renting those places. I mean, the cities are going to be chaos. It'll be pretty bad. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe they implement really strong controls and people accept it. And only certain places are bad in the ghettos of the main city. But outside in rural places, you'll be okay. You know, at some point, you've got to think the people uh, who have the ability to enforce things, so that would be the military and police, I mean, how much are they going to allow to happen too if they see their families being theft off their land? Are they going to go out and do that? I don't see it, particularly not if you're in a country where there's a lot of people who are still farmers on rural communities. So, you know, you have to think these things through. You have to get yourself the highest level of resiliency and safety possible. You have to think about counterparty risk. Gold and silver outside the system, I think it's never, ever been more important. 
Uh, some people add to that Bitcoin too. I did do a podcast on Bitcoin, so you can check that out if you want to have a better understanding of the risks that might be there. And if you listen to the most recent episode of the Parallel Mike podcast, Vampire Bankers, the central bank scam, that is all tied into this. That tells you how this was created. And I'm going to put the link in the description for that. Also, you can check me out on Patreon. You can check me out on my website. I do do wealth preservation consultations. Uh, and I've got something else to talk about in those consultations now, although I always spoke to people about how in this collapse, the equities portion, it's, yeah, you don't want to be there. So and um, what that means in the interim period, well, that's something to think about too. So I'm going to call it a wrap for tonight's show. I hope you enjoyed this one. Please let me know in the comment section what you thought of this document. Please let me know how you're going to respond to it. And yeah, thank you for listening. And I will see you all in the next one. And enjoy that stiff drink that I know you're going to be having before bed tonight.